Um, so I'm going to talk about my experiences of writing the annual and monthly board reports. Um, when I say my, I have to include Carol, who's our senior nurse for staffing, so lives and breathes this with me, so forgive me for saying my. Um, I've, we've just written our fifth annual report, actually, so we're kind of getting well practised at this. So just a bit of an overview of the board, and I know Michelle's going to talk to you much more detailed about how these things get discussed at board level. But the purpose of the board is to make sure they govern effectively, and in doing so, that they build public and patient and stakeholder confidence in the care that they provide. And they do this by ensuring that they've got a, a strong strategy for the organisation, um, that they are accountable for the care that's delivered within that organisation, that there is a culture within that organisation that is transparent and open. Um, and so the purpose of the report is to help the board do that. You've heard already how um, nursing has a significant impact on care outcomes and patient safety. Um, just a little bit of a revisit of the National Quality Board standards. Um, so the purpose of the, the report is that we demonstrate to the board, we provide assurance that we have the right staff, that we set our establishments using evidence-based tools and those tools are implemented as per the guidance without any local um, deviation from that that we have good professional judgment in there that is multi, at least multi um, from different levels, so a matron and a head of nursing, for example, um, and that we benchmark with peers. So the model hospital is beginning to give us that, but I think there's some work to go in terms of classification of specialty, but it is beginning to give us that. And it gives us it, at least in our own hospital, you can compare like wards. Um, in terms of staff having the right skills, so. The annual report's a great opportunity to report on mandatory training and to highlight any issues you might have with kind of CPD. I know struggling with it at UCH, it's no, um, and it's a national problem as well. Um, working as a multi-professional team and then recruitment and retention. It's a great opportunity to put kind of nursing vacancies, issues with retention on the agenda as well. And then expectation three is all around staff being in the right place at the right time. I know you've had a good conversation about rostering earlier, but this is about you know, having productive working and eliminating waste. So not just about rostering, but kind of good job plans for all of the workforce. Um, efficient deployment and flexibility, so safe levelling of staff, not just moving staff to where they're needed, but making sure that staff are moved safely within their sphere of um, practice and minimising agency, which is, you know, we'd all like to do, but I think we're probably all using a bit more agency than we'd like to. Um, implementing care hours per day, so I know you've had a long discussion about that. Um, having a local quality dashboard for safe and sustainable s staffing, and being able to triangu triangulate that with outcomes, so kind of um, patient outcomes, productivity and financial outcomes, alongside kind of incident reporting, any SIs, and then feedback from our patients and carers and our staff. At UCLH, we're really lucky because we have our exemplar ward program. Um, so this is how we triangulate our staffing metrics with those things. There are five pillars to our um, accreditation program. So quality and safety, so this is our nurse sensitive indicators for patient outcomes. Um, efficiency, so ensuring that we've got the right number of staff. The patient experience metric is all about kind of patients, how they value their care, but also are our care processes being adhered to? Are they having timely um, medications or timely risk assessments, etc.? Staff experience, notwithstanding that, you know, a happy and engaged workforce has a massive impact on patient outcomes. And then the final pillar of ours is about improving, so using quality improvement methodology for a ward-based pro uh, ward project to resolve an issue that they are concerned about. Um, this program is nurse-led, but it's multidisciplinary. So the metrics are not all sensitive to nursing. Um, so thinking about the, the annual and the monthly report, the purpose of it. So the report should allow the board to decide if the following expectations are met. So 
Is the staffing sufficient and sustainable across all care settings? So I think most of us have been very ward focused and we're now widening this across all care settings and I don't know, we're not on allocate but we're kind of, we struggle to do our monthly reporting because of that. Um, that our leaders and managers are appropriately skilled to support the staff and making sure that there's a multi-professional um, team approach in all care settings and the staff deployment, so this whole thing about making sure that our wards, are safe, wards and departments are safe 24-7 and that when we need to level staff that it is done safely based on patient acuity and dependency. So my experience of annual report preparation. Um, so this um, is our establishment setting cycle. Um, it's Anne Casey, Stolen Shamelessly. Um, so I think the most, one of the biggest lessons I've learned in the time I've been doing this is they keep, keep bringing the financial planning deadlines forward. So we historically did all of our establishment setting in January because they were financially planning in February. Last year they moved it forward. So we've moved it forward to be in line with that because our finance colleagues um, think that if they've already set the budget, you can't add anything new. So just be conscious of when the planning deadlines are and how long you're planning for, because we had a cycle of two years, which, you know, can catch you out. Um, think about getting those meetings in the diary early, because you need a lot of people in that room. So we have the ward sister, the matron, head of nursing, myself and Carol as the critical friends, and then finance and HR and make sure when they leave that room they know what, is, what staffing is either going in or coming out because the nurses tend to forget the ones that are coming out and finance forget the ones that are going in. So make sure you've documented it so that they know and, and follow it up quickly. Um, I think the other thing is, is that to agree that staffing is going in before you even start writing the report, it's really important that Actually, when your chief nurse goes into that room, you've done everything you can to make sure that that funding is essentially agreed. So we have a group model at UCH with, this, with three different groups, and we do our absolute best to make sure that the medical directors lead those groups at UCH, to make sure that those medical directors are supportive of any posts that are going in. Um, I think the other thing to say is involve workforce colleagues early, because although the, the report at the moment is essentially about nursing and midwifery, they have a real vested interest in kind of the workforce planning, retention and recruitment and staff experience. And they can be a really good source of helping you write what can be quite a long report. I always include an executive summary. Our board packs often have two to 300 pages. And I think that when you've produced a report that's got 12 pages, expecting someone to digest it when it's probably gone out a few days before board is quite hard work. So get the key points in the executive summary and anything you want to put on the radar there so that they've got it at a glance in the meeting. Um, my experience is it generally takes longer than you expect, so we started right now in September. Um, it was finished by December, but it's just gone to the board next week. Um, and make sure that it contains all the relevant information. I think there is sometimes a tendency um, to put as much information as there as you, in there as you can. And actually, you need to just put enough in and don't kind of drown them in data. Put the relevant data in that helps them make the decision. So I'd say it's definitely about quality and not quantity. And that's worked for us so far. So I, this is my fifth report, and we've had year-on-year -year investment in the nurse staffing. So it's kind of, it's tried and tested and it's working so far. I think the other thing it's helped us to do is to really shine a light on the issues there are within the nursing workforce. We've always been a little bit um, behind the curves in terms of feeling the pressure of the vacancies that there are nationally. But what it has helped us to do by putting the national context on their radar is we've secured some charitable funding to implement the RN apprenticeship. So by putting these things in the report and giving context, it does help you to secure investment for the future. Um, so my annual report, well, mine and Carol's annual report, so as I said, we always put an executive summary in there. I always restate the purpose of the report because people forget that they've got to see it, and so you get asked, why is that coming? So we have a bold line that says it's a requirement of the National Quality Board standards, and that's why they're seeing it. 
remind them of the triangulated approach to setting establishments and how we have a supervisory band seven and the headroom that's in. I received an email only a few weeks ago that said to me, when you set these establishments, Julie, do you just say what they need and then everyone does as you tell them? I wish, <laughs> I wish. But show them the rigor that it's been through so that you don't get questions like that coming back to you. Um, obviously provide the um, proposed establishment changes, both in whole times and in financial impact, whether it is um, an increase or a decrease, and generally with ours, some areas decrease, some areas go up. So kind of make it clear where the changes are affected. And then we always provide an appendix of every ward and department. Um, show the benchmarking with peers so that you can see over time. So we provide the six month, the prior six months of our CHPPD and CPCH so they can see that it's stable and how we compare with our peers, we still use planned versus actual as well because that's a metric that they're really familiar with. So and it means more to them if I'm completely honest at the moment. Um, and then your measurement and improvement summary. So these are all your, uh, as we have the exemplar um, ward accreditation programme, we produce some key metrics that show how we've progressed over that time. Alongside our staffing incidents and any red flag incidents, alongside the staff experience survey results. We also have a pulse survey, so if it's not the one that coincides with the national results coming out, we provide some detail on that. Um, and then the chief nurse and the medical director must confirm in a statement to the board that they are satisfied with the outcome of the assessment. That's a must and we're gonna be assessed on that annually. Uh, so from a monthly report, content perspective. This one is, um, it feels like it comes around really quickly. Um, so we just have a template that we update, probably like most of you guys. So again, an executive summary because they often don't have time to read the full report. Um, summary of the staffing position. So we report on planned and actual as well as CHPPD. We include all of our workforce metrics. So kind of thinking about vacancy rates across registered and unregistered, turnover across those groups, our temporary staffing usage, as well as um, whether the breakdown between bank and agency. And we have a ward level split that will show kind of what proportion of staff were on that, were um, temporary staffing for that ward by day and by night. Um, Agency ceiling, I don't know how many of you are compliant with your agency ceiling, but we've um, blown it this year because we've got a big IT project ongoing. But we report on our compliance with that. Um, and then the financial position. Um, the finance director is forever asking for more detail on that, but actually we keep it fairly high level because this report isn't about the finance, it's about triangulating it alongside the staffing. So we fought quite hard to not make the report dominated by finance. We now include the roster KPIs, um, the ones that we can report on at the moment, and that will increase when we change our roster system. But we found that that really helped us with our use of resources assessment, kind of demonstrating that those metrics do reach board level. So highly recommend putting those in. And then the key quality and safety metrics. So we report on areas that we're concerned about or areas for improvement in the monthly report. And again, kind of give a bit of an update on the national context. So we get the Shelford Group weekly updates and they have a section on workforce and we basically plagiarise that and put it into our report because it's a really good summary of what's going on nat nationally. And it just helps keep the national picture in context with what's happening locally. Uh, so key principles, there's definitely a difference between assurance and reassurance. So assurance is the objective data that you're presenting for them to, to make a decision about whether the staffing is safe and sustainable. Reassurance is my view that it's safe and sustainable. So don't mix the two up. I think what I find is sometimes people believe the data until it doesn't say what they want it to say. <laughs> But, you know, give them, give them the data to make their own decision. Um, remember that it should contain everything they need to be assured that the staffing is safe. Um, 
don't put irrelevant detail in, keep it as, a, as short as you can because, as I say, these papers are, you know, two to three hundred pages at a time. And be transparent and honest. Like, sometimes I look at ours and I think, oh my goodness, you know, how am I going to explain that we've, the financial position swung by 300k a month? It's kind of, we've just got to report it and sort it out after. And that's it from me. I think we're doing questions at the end.